Tonight we're in Acts chapter 10. We're going to continue on here in the story here in the word Acts chapter 10. So turn with me there if you're not already. Now, we're going to see some really cool and interesting things going on here. Um, Just some dramatic history-changing events happening here in Acts chapter 10. There were a couple apples that were hanging in a tree one day and looking down on everyone below them and seeing just all the indifference, the prejudice going on below them and people fighting and bickering. One of the apples said to the other, I can't believe all the pettiness and squabbling that's going on among all those people fighting over race and and ethnic differences. One day, us apples are going to be all that's left. We're going to be the only ones left and we're going to rule the earth. And the other apple looked at him and said, well, which ones, the red or the green ones? Prejudiced. Racism. Indifference. There there can be that in our circles, in our world, the things that that we see all around us. And it was no different here in Bible times. There was some indifference and prejudice that was going on. Well, in Acts chapter 10, we begin to see some huge walls, some great barriers getting knocked down by the Lord. It's exciting. And it starts with this young, with this man, Cornelius. Let me get my place here. I was in the wrong book. I was in John chapter 10. All right. Acts chapter 10. Right in verse 1, what do we read? There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So here we are turned now, our focus to Caesarea. It's up on the Mediterranean coast. It's uh, a number of miles up from Jerusalem on the coast in Judea. And Caesarea was the headquarters for the Roman governor of Judea. It was there that Herod began to build a lot of great structures and buildings. And you can go there today, see some exciting, wonderful um, uh, Roman relics and, and stuff there. It's pretty amazing. But here's... Cornelius there, and it, and it says that he's a, a Roman centurion. A centurion was an officer who was in the Roman army and was over 100 soldiers. So here's a man that's, that's well, um, highly regarded, and he's given position over other soldiers. So 100 soldiers that he's over. And it's very interesting that each time we read of a centurion in the scriptures that they are looked at in a very promising light, in a very favorable light. In Luke chapter 7, it was a centurion that was there at the cross when Jesus was being crucified. Or sorry, no, I'm skipping ahead here. Luke 7 was a centurion that came to Jesus with a request for his servant to be healed. And remember as he comes there, he's saying, I I know that you're a Jew and that it's not proper for you, you know, to enter in a Gentile's house. So he says, you just need to speak the word and my servant will be healed. Right, remember that? And Jesus said there in Luke 7 verse 9, I say to you, I've not found such great faith, not even in Israel. So the centurion was looked at and and even highly regarded by Jesus, a man with great faith. And then it was in Matthew chapter 27 that we see another centurion who was at the cross when Jesus was being crucified. And when Jesus gave up his last breath and there was the earthquake and and the darkness and everything, that the centurion said, truly, this was the Son of God. Again, a, a centurion, a Roman soldier who's there just to, you know, make sure this, this man dies. He looks at what's going on and with his heart just says, truly this was the son of God. I mean, he couldn't get most Jews to recognize that, yet this Roman centurion does himself. So they're seen in scripture as people that are, are seen a favorable light. And it's the same here in Acts chapter 10 as we come across this, this Roman centurion. Notice, it says there in verse Two, that he was a devout man and one who feared God. Now, being devout meant that you were pious. You had a real respect, a reverence for God. Or you could say that he was a God-fear, as what's meant there, one who feared God. A God-fear. Now, most scholars agree that, that that was a technical term describing a Gentile who was attached, who has attached himself to Judaism, but chose not to undergo formal conversion which would have included circumcision and public immersion, baptism, that sort of a thing. And so when a person did all those things, they converted to Judaism, they followed the the laws of Judaism, they followed their God, and also submitted themselves to these um, ritualistic acts in a sense. They were then called a proselyte. 
And the Jews would call them proselytes of the gate. They were, uh, uh, this man here, Cornelius, was believed to be a man that was termed a proselyte of the gate, which meant that they were attracted to the Jewish form of worship, monotheism, the high moral standards, their lifestyle, but for various reasons didn't become Jews. They didn't go all the way in, in circumcision, outward baptism, that sort of a thing. They didn't go all the way. Gentiles that became proselytes, they were no longer seen as Gentiles. But God fears these proselytes of the gate, however, were still seen as Gentiles and then were still considered unclean in the eyes of the Jews. So that's this man, Cornelius, a proselyte of the gate. He's gone very close to converting to Judaism, but has not gone all the way, all right? He's devout. He's a follower of God to some degree, but he's still a Gentile and he's still seen as unclean, all right? Though this man lived an honorable life, he it says that he prayed to God always. He, he gave. We're going to see that as we move along that this man was still lacking. It's an important truth to see here, guys, that this man lived a very honorable life. Feared God. He, he gave alms generously to the people. Prayed always. Think about that. But this man was still lacking because he still needed Jesus in his life. He still needed Jesus to save him. C.S. Lewis used to say, you cannot go on being a good egg forever. You must either hatch or rot. That's the case here. There's a lot of people that are living their life thinking that I'm a good person. Well, that's great. You can be a good person, no doubt about it, but it doesn't mean that you're saved. Good people are not going to get to heaven. Only saved people are. Sinners that have repented and put their trust in Jesus Christ. A good egg can't be a good egg forever. You must either hatch or rot. That's good. So we see here in this chapter, as as we get into this, that God is interested in not just saving sinners, but in saving good people too. Because good people need to be saved. Understand that. He's not just saving those that are down and out, but he's saving those that are, in their eyes, good people. Because they're still lacking without Jesus. And God is going to set up a special appointment now for this man, Cornelius, so that he might be presented with the gospel and have opportunity to get right with God and and put his trust in Jesus. God is going to go all out to see this guy be brought to the faith. Now it says in verse 3 there, that about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. So the ninth hour was about 3 p.m., it was a, a time where uh, Jews would go to this hour of prayer, all right? They had different times where they would go and pray. So this ninth hour being 3 p.m. was one of those times. And while Cornelius, being a, a faithful man, he's out praying again, he receives his vision. God shows him that he sees his heart and devotion. And it says that, that that all came up as a memorial to God. The word memorial, it's, it's sacrificial language. Cornelius wasn't a guy that could go to the temple and offer up sacrifices, but the very things that he's doing here, God is seen as, in a sense, a, a sacrifice to him, that it's his holy lifestyle that was being received as that offering a memorial before God. This was a man that was doing what he thought was pleasing to the Lord, and the Lord is now going to open up his heart to do a fuller and, and greater work in his life, to reveal a fuller and greater work truth to him and bring him into a fuller and greater relationship with God that's what God is seeking to do and as we seek to live for and please the Lord God is going to bless that and give an even fuller revelation of who he is which is only going to increase our joy in him you know as we're seeking the Lord as we're going out we don't do these things to be more right with God but no doubt as we're giving ourselves to the Lord and serving him that it just enables us to grow even closer to him and know him in a greater way which only allows us to have that increase of joy in our lives and then it says in verse five now send men to joppa and send for simon whose surname is peter he is lodging with simon a tanner whose house is by the sea and he will tell you what you must do so here's god desiring to bring this man cornelius into that more fuller relationship with who he is and so he sends him to go and get Peter. Peter's going to be the one to tell Cornelius what he must do to enter into that truer and deeper relationship with God. 
Now, an important question to ask here is, why couldn't God have just had that angel reveal that to him, right? I mean, Cornelius receives his vision by this angel of God. He's, he's given this great, um, you know, word. Why couldn't God have just used that angel to speak into Cornelius' life and say, Cornelius, listen, you need Jesus. I sent my son to die for the world that the world might be saved through him. This is all you need. Or God could have just spoken the word himself. God could have just revealed this all to Cornelius, but yet he makes Cornelius go and call upon Peter. Why? Why would that happen that way? God could have easily carried that out himself. But here's the great thing is that God chooses to use his human vessels and instruments to carry out his work in sharing the gospel. This is not the place of angels to do. And yes, God could do it and sometimes has, but he chooses to use his human instruments to be those that will be his witnesses and bring the, the gospel to a lost and, and dying world. And it's going to be an, an act of faith for Cornelius too to actually go and send men to go and get Peter and to take that time to hear from Peter. It's going to, in a sense, be that, that test, if you would like, to say, Cornelius, are you really willing to take that step of faith to see what I have for you, you know? And notice in verse 7, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now Joppa was about 30 miles south of Caesarea along the coast. So the Lord has prepared Cornelius for something great. Now as these men make their way to Peter, look at what we're going to see here because the Lord is going to now prepare Peter for what he's going to encounter as well. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray. It was about the sixth hour. Sixth hour being 12 p.m. and another time of, of prayer. So Peter goes up on the housetop. The housetops in that day were, you know, flat surfaces. They were kind of like a patio or a balcony. Great places to go and sort of have some quiet time to get alone with the Lord. You know, if parents had kids and the kids are fighting, parents just take a, you know, siesta up on the house, on the rooftop of the house, right? Just kind of get away, have some quiet time, you know? It's a great go-to place here. And so there's Peter. He's up on the rooftop, and he's just uh, praying, spending time with the Lord. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. And in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So it's noontime, or as we like to call it, lunchtime, right? Lunchtime. Here's Peter, of course, at the time of prayer, but it's lunchtime. He's getting very hungry, right? How many people can attest to that, can say, hey, man, I bear witness to that. I know what that's like. Uh, and, and it says that, that the, the people there were, were preparing, you know, making ready, right? Perhaps they're making ready for lunch, and Peter can smell the smells coming up from the house. He's like, man, I'm so distracted. I can't pray, and, and he's hungry, Stomach's grumbling. And so the time that he, he falls into a trance. Interesting. And in this trance or vision, Peter sees something like this great sheet that's let down from heaven to the earth with all sorts of animals on it. And the Lord gives him this command. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now that's cool because Peter was thinking about food, right? I mean, that's what he's got on his mind right now. He's trying to pray, but he's getting distracted. He's He's hungry, his stomach's rumbling, and he's got food on his mind. So what does the Lord do? He communicates a truth to him based on the condition that Peter's at right now. Isn't that cool? You know, the Lord will often speak to you in the very condition or things that you're dealing with or going through in your life. Right that time. Maybe you've experienced that before, you know. You're going through something, and the Lord speaks to you using those very things that you're kind of working through or, or dealing with. And in that condition, God comes, reveals a very important truth and message to Peter. I like that. He'll often use the condition we're in to speak that truth or reveal himself to us. And so we read that a voice came to him. Now, how does God speak to us? We often love to hear, you know, we would always love, how many times you sit there and go, Lord, just speak to me. Uh, like, I want to hear it. God, audible voice, right? I want to hear that loud rumble from heaven. Lord, speak to me, right? How many people want that? And you don't raise your hands. Man, I would love to hear that. I'll tell you, God doesn't speak to me that way. And, and perhaps he doesn't speak to you that way, though 
We would love to hear that. It's rare for God to speak in an audible voice. More often, God speaks to our, our inner man. Just as he was speaking to Peter in a vision, what is that happening? It's happening by the mind's eye, right? In the inner self. It's not something that everybody sees. It's something that Peter sees in a, in a vision. And even so, we can hear the voice of God with the mind's ear, just like Peter was seeing with the mind's eye. God does not need sound waves to fall on an eardrum to speak to a man. When it pleases him to do so, he can speak directly to one's mind where all sound waves are finally interpreted as, as Lovett said. Now, in this vision, what did Peter see? He saw the sheep come down with all these different kinds of animals. Kosher food and non-kosher food to the Jew. Clean and unclean animals and food is what he saw on this blanket. The stuff a good Jew just wouldn't touch. But now Peter is being told to go and eat it. This is the original pigs in a blanket, by the way, right here. This is where it all originated. How many of you have had pigs in a blanket before? Good stuff, right? That's where it all began, right here. And so the sheet set down, clean and unclean, kosher, non-kosher food, stuff that, you know, Jews wouldn't touch anything that's unclean or non-kosher. And God's saying, Peter, free game right now. Rise, kill, and eat. It's all good. That's what God was saying to Peter. Peter, this is all good. But look at what Peter says. Look at his response here, verse 14. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. So guys, check out Peter's response here. Basically, God says, Peter, go for it. I'm declaring this clean. It's all good. What does Peter say? No way, God. Uh-uh. Are you kidding me, God? What's happened to you? Lord, you know what you're saying here. He says, no way, Lord. And, and that, by the way, is a great oxymoron, isn't it, to say, not so, Lord. You can't put those two things together, can you? Dr. W. Graham Scroggy comments, whoever says, not so, should never add, Lord. And whoever truly says, Lord, will never say, not so. Isn't that true? You can't say, not so, and add the word Lord to it. And by the way, you can't call out Lord or say Lord and add those words, not so. They don't mix. They don't go together. And Peter's struggling over this right now. Because this has been years of teaching and thinking on, on Peter's part here. He's lived this life avoiding all that has been common or unclean. He's essentially right now putting God in a box of thinking this is the way that he must work and he won't go against that. Lord, no way. I've been told all my life, we've been following the scriptures that this is what we are to eat. This is what, what we can't eat. And now you're adjusting that. Uh-uh. He's restricting God. He's, he's limiting God here is what he's doing. Cornelius had a much easier time responding in obedience than Peter did. Now, we're going to see that God had a much bigger target for this than just food. This was just how he revealed this truth to Peter. But we know God was speaking to people and his desire was to reach all people for salvation. That was the ultimate truth that he wants to get through and we'll see that as we move along. But right now, Peter's having a very hard time with this idea that all food now? We've had a strict dietary you know, law that we've been following and now you're saying that all food is, is clean? How can that be? Now again, this is the truth that he's revealing to Peter to convey a greater truth. And the greater truth was not a contradiction to God's word. It was in contradiction to what Jews believed, that only Jews could be saved. And if you want to be saved right with God, you had to become Jew. A Jewish man would pray, thank you God for not making me a Gentile, a woman, or a slave. That's what they'd pray every day. They were so glad that they were a Jew and not a Gentile. I mean, just... Again, that, that bigotry that they were living with through their life. God is radically altering their, their ideology right now regarding Gentiles. And as Peter was afraid of altering what he believed to be written in stone, God was revealing what he intended to do all along. This was not done in, in contradiction to God's word, but to complete God's word, you see. Now we know today 
This is important. We know today that God will not contradict his word because we have the completed word of God. There are those that will come along today and say, oh, listen, I've got a new revelation for you, a new truth today. This is where it's at. But let me tell you guys, if it's in contradiction to the word of God, have nothing to do with it. You can rest assured, I don't need that because I've got the word of God and I have all that I need right here in the word of God. God will not contradict his word today. But here they did not have the completed word of God. And God was not doing necessarily a a, a new thing to the extent that it was altering what he's already done, but he was just furthering now what he's intended to do all along. And just in case Peter didn't quite get it the first time, what does he do? He repeats this now three times for him, doesn't he, there in verse 16. This was done three times and the object was taken up in heaven again. It, it, it kind of like Peter was a guy that really, you know, was accustomed to having things happen in threes, right? You know, he denied the Lord three times and then he was restored to ministry three times in a threefold way, right? Now he's receiving this vision in, in three ways. Maybe he's just still, you know, Got a bit of a, a thick head, and the Lord says, I'm, I'll have grace with you, Peter. I'll help you out here. Do this a few more times than just once so that you really get it. So here it is, coming to him three times, really having this imprinted on his heart. Because this is an important deal, right? And that's, that's the thing that we need to emphasize here, that this was world-changing stuff. This was epic, what was going on right here. So the Lord says, I want you to really get this here, Peter. I want this to be imprinted on your heart. This is a big deal, what's going on here. And so look at what we read in verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, this is cool because we see God working on both sides here, right? Notice what we see in the beginning of the chapter. Cornelius receives his vision from the Lord. And then in the very next section, we see that Peter receives a vision from the Lord. God is working on both sides, right? And he's causing them to come together. He speaks to Cornelius. He prepares him. And he also speaks directly to Peter and prepares him. It wasn't one-sided. You know, too often today, people can take a word from another person believing this to be from God and accept it as gospel truth. And, and quite often, God will speak in your heart a, a truth or a direction, or, yeah, speak in your heart a truth or a direction, and we'll have someone come along and speak that as well as confirmation. Be careful not to take a word someone shares with you and run with it before hearing it from God yourself. That's how God is going to work. Not just being one-sided. I've seen many people running around saying, I've got a word for you from the Lord. You're to sell your house and you're to to move to, you know, Timbuktu or something. And that person's like, oh, wow, man, amazing. That's a word from the Lord. All right, wow, I I had no idea about that. But okay, if that's from the Lord. I've heard people take, maybe not to that degree, that'd be pretty drastic. But I've heard people, you know, receiving a word from another person and accepting that as gospel truth. Understand if somebody comes to you with a word that you take that, and you say, Lord, what are you saying to this? And most often, it's going to be something that God's already working in your heart. And it just is simply confirmation to what God's been speaking to you. That's what it would have been with Peter and Cornelius here. They would have heard from each other and go, man, this is not just me. It's not just me having, you know, some bad pizza the night before where I got mixed up in the message. This is really God working. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to me. It's not just one-sided here. We have to be careful in in even Christian circles that, you know, we're hearing from the Lord ourselves. And if somebody comes along with the word, that's something that just is is a confirmation of what God's already revealing and speaking into your heart. Now, as Peter wondered about this whole vision, it says that he's wondering about this there. And literally, it means that he's, he's perplexed over this in verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself, he's perplexed about this. He's, he's kind of confused. And during this whole time, the Holy Spirit now is speaking to him and says, go with them. 
I like that. God is very specific with the directions. As he, as he was with Cornelius, even though all the details are not filled in, right? Holy Spirit says to Peter, go with them. God may just give you the direction without the details. But if the Lord is speaking to you and revealing that to you, then that's enough. God just simply wants us to be those that are ready to obey and listen and move as he gives the direction without worrying about the details because God's got that sorted out and taken care of, right? Too often, we fail to walk in obedience because we want to know all the details. We don't know what's all going to happen. The Lord doesn't always work that way. He gives us that direction, says go. And as we begin to go, then he begins to lay out a little bit more of the details as we go. They become a little bit more known to us as we begin to walk in obedience. Notice then, and Peter went down in verse 21, to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, yes, I'm he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews, was divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Now, Peter must have been shocked to see these visitors showing up, right? I mean, he would have realized quickly that they weren't Jews. And what would have really thrown Peter for a loop was the fact that God has spoken to these people. He's spoken to non-Jews. He's spoken to Gentiles. God, you've heard from the Lord? And now you're here before me? It's God that has led them to Peter. And I'm sure at this point that Peter's starting to get a little idea now of what God is up to. Okay, you're speaking to me. You're revealing this sheep. Don't call common that which is now clean. You know, it's like, okay, uh, Lord, what are you doing here? Gentiles are showing up at my door. They're saying they've heard from you. Something's going on. And already we're starting to see a change in Peter. Look at what we read in verse 23. Then he invited them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them and some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Look at what Peter does. He invites them in and he, and he lodges them. And this wasn't just Peter, you know, saying, listen, guys, um, I've got a room down in the basement. It's a little bit dirty, but you guys can stay there. Just don't touch anything, all right? Just, I don't want to hear you. I don't want to see you. Just don't, you know, just try to stay there. And as soon as sunup comes, just get on your way. It says that he lodges them. In other words, he brings them in and he entertains them in a sense. He cared for them. This wasn't Peter keeping those walls up saying, I can't have anything to do with you. I mean, it was just unlawful for a Gentile to go into a Jew's house or for a Jew to go into a Gentile's house. This was not right. This was not common. But Peter's already receiving that word from the Lord And we're already seeing change. We're already seeing walls and barriers of bigotry being broken down, aren't we, right now? He brings them in. I love that. And now, in verse 24, the following day they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself... I'm also a man. Look at what Cornelius is doing here. He's demonstrating great, incredible faith here. Because he sends his men out, go get Peter. He doesn't know how Peter's going to respond, right? He doesn't know how Peter's going to react to this. For all he knows, Peter's going to be like, no way, I'm not going to Caesarea. I'm not going to some, you know, Gentile, let alone a Roman centurion. Forget it, man. I'm not having anything to do with that, right? Cornelius doesn't know how Peter's going to act. But what is Cornelius doing? He's inviting all of his family and his friends to his house to say, guys, you got to come over. Peter's coming. Think about that, right? This guy is responding in faith. Now, I can imagine them all wondering, what's up, Cornelius? What's so important? What's going on? Cornelius saying, hey, man, a guy named Peter's coming over. Well, well who's that? I, I, I don't know. I've never met him. Well, what's he going to do? I have no idea. I mean, that's not the kind of party invitation you send out to people, right? You want a little bit more details about this, right? But he's inviting everybody over. Guys, you got to come. Why? I don't know. Just come, all right? This is going to be good. Cornelius knew that God was up to something. And I pray that we're ready to respond with such faith when God begins to stir our hearts over something. That we're not sitting back going, oh, you know what? I'll wait and see how this plays out, you know? I'm just going to play it easy right now. I'm going to lay low. And uh, God, yep, I, I believe. But 
I'm not going to really act too much right now. I want to see how this is all going to work. I don't want to embarrass myself, you know what I'm saying? Let's wait and see how this all plays out. Man, Cornelius didn't worry about that. He's like responding hugely in faith. I pray that we do. When God stirs our heart over something that we're ready to respond in faith and say, man, I don't care what happens. God's moving. I'm just going to be a part of it. I'm going to get busy in this. Cornelius does just that. And notice Peter not only refused to treat Cornelius like a dog as he comes in, but now Peter's refusing to be treated like a god. He refuses to treat Cornelius like a dog, and he refuses himself to be treated like a god. Because Cornelius falls down on his feet, and, and he begins to worship him. I mean, Cornelius is just going, man, you're like, you're like sent from God here. You're the man. And he begins to worship him. Not cool. Peter says, no, unless I'm, I'm also a man. The Bible always condemns, you know, this kind of worship of men and even of angels, right? You know that, that people still do that today? In Rome, in St. Peter's Basilica, they line up in front, in front of Michelangelo's statue just to kiss the feet of the statue of Peter, that Michelangelo did. They're lining up just to kiss his feet, so much so that over the years, the, the big toe has fallen off. I mean, there's been so much people that's coming, flocking and worshiping the statue who's of a man, right? I mean, this sort of still stuff just goes on. It's wrong. It's not healthy. We elevate and idolize people, and it ought not be. Peter instinctively knew this, and he knew his frailties. He knew his weaknesses. And he knew only one is worthy of worship. It's his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It'd be a good thing if all self-appointed successors of Peter would imitate his humility and forbidding people to come and kneel down before them too. And you know who I'm talking about, but we'll leave it at that. Verse 27. It says, And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? Notice here that as Peter moved in obedience, that God began to give fuller details to what God was doing in Peter's life. Because so far, remember here, now Peter's only seen the sheet come down with the animals on it, right? Seeing animals uh, clean and unclean, kosher, unkosher, and just, you know, here you go, Peter. This is all good to eat. But now he knows it's more than just about animals. It's about people, right? That he should not call any man common or unclean, Peter says. He's revealing now what God intends to do, that he should not call any man common or unclean. Peter, responding in faith, is getting a bit more full of revelation. The details are coming into view now as to what God is desiring to do. And in order for that to happen, what needed to take place? That step of faith, right? A step of faith. Peter didn't have all the details, just had direction, go. And Peter does. And now he comes upon Cornelius' house. And notice there, in, right in verse 27, he went in. Now guys, think about that. That's huge, right? Peter went in. He didn't stand outside and go, hey, hey, Cornelius, why don't you come out here? Let's, let's talk out here. I'm still a little bit, I don't know, coming into your house. Ah, I don't know. I'm a little bit freaked out. This just doesn't feel right. He went in. Again, that was very unlawful for a Jewish person to set foot into a Gentile's house. This right now, with that step into his home, is a pivotal point in history right here, guys, this is huge. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind right here. It was reminiscent of the veil being torn in the temple when Jesus died. And it was a whole new way being opened up. Well, that's what God is doing right now. Because he's opening up the way now for Gentiles to be saved. And Peter opens up his discussion with them and reminding them just how unlawful it is for him to be there. Right? You know how unlawful it is, he says, for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. Basically, it's equivalent to saying, I, I could really be picking up cooties from you guys just being here. Right? But God was doing something big. God was doing something huge. And then he asks them why they have sent for him. Now, that seems kind of peculiar, right? Why have you sent for me? Doesn't everyone know already? But Peter, you see, is causing them to prepare their hearts and declare themselves declare themselves what they are in need of. 
He's seeking to draw out that kind of confession within their own, own hearts. Basically, it'd be similar to saying, what do you hope for here? What are you looking to get? What are you in need of? So Cornelius said, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send, therefore, to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Interestingly, Cornelius, though not a believer, look at this, how his prayers heard, it says. Cornelius, your prayer has been heard in verse 31. Sometimes we think, oh, man, God's not going to, hear any prayer other than from a believer. But I like that he hears prayer from all people, right? Cornelius, not a believer, yet his prayers were heard. And he's told to call Simon here. Again, God could have just communicated the gospel himself through a vision or used the angel, but he doesn't. He chooses to use his human servants in proclaiming the gospel. Just as he sent Philip, you know, all the way to the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Sent a human agent to go and declare the gospel. And to share the good news with that man. Now, this here is just a, a pastor's dream, a preacher's dream. A house full of people just intently waiting to hear what the Lord has put on their heart. You know, they said, we're, we're here to hear all the things commanded you by God. So they're sitting back going, so fire away, man. We're ready for it. That's great. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon was asked, what makes a good preacher? He replied, a great congregation. That's awesome. I'm still looking to be a good preacher one day. But um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm Great congregation right here. Don't know that equates to a good preacher, but great congregation. You guys rock. Really, truthfully. Now, verse 34. By the way, just a quick question. Is anybody finding it cold in here, or is it just me? Very cold, like your fridge. Okay. Um, somebody want to call upon Randy, maybe? I think he might be in the foyer. and Just tell him to um, have the heat come on there. Thanks. So look at verse 34 here. As we begin to see Peter... Share and just unfold the gospel now. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now the Jews did believe that God was, was partial to them, right? The Jews felt, we're the ones that are to be saved. We're God's chosen and special people. Man, God even hates the Gentiles. They're the pagan people. They thought that God was indeed partial. But that went against even their own scriptures. Look at what Deuteronomy 10, verse 17 says. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. And 2 Chronicles 19, 7. Now therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality nor taking of bribes. But it says God shows no partiality. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful news, guys? That God is not partial? Aren't you glad for that? I have a hard time being impartial at times. I'm sure we all do at times. We gravitate to those that we connect with or have similar interests with. I gravitate to those with great bank accounts that are very generous. That's the people I... No, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't gravitate to that. But it's not hard to be partial, right? We all, I'm sure, at times struggle with that. We have favorites, right? We do those kinds of things. But God does not respond to people based on their birthplace, their background, their bank account, or their abilities. He simply accepts all those who fear him. As it says, turn their hearts to him. Nobody, nobody gets the boot with God. God's not partial. God's not showing favoritism. Aren't you glad that he's not lining up against the wall saying, okay, I'll take that person, I'll take that person, you, you, no way. And moving through, aren't you glad for that? Man, he's accepting all those that are willing to turn their heart to him. Now, what that says in verse 35, look at that there. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Some might look at that and go, oh, well, that's the way to be saved. We just have to work the works of righteousness. There it is right there for us. Just have to do those things and, and we'll be saved. It's not saying that doing works of righteousness will save you. You, you. you still need Jesus as your Savior. This here simply is referring to and implying that God will respond to such people as who are turning their hearts to him so that he may give more fuller light and understanding to them. These are the people that are going to 
have a chance just to really hear the gospel and who are there ready to respond. And so Peter does just that now. He begins to reveal Jesus Christ to them. That's what they are in need of. They're in need of Jesus Christ. And so he begins now to preach Jesus to them. Look at verse 36. The word which God sent to their children, or to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Peter says this is a word that began with the Jews first, but that it was for all people. Because why? It says Jesus is Lord of all. He's not Lord of the Jews. He's Lord of all. So Peter is declaring and showing here that Jesus has come to save all people. He says that word, you know, this spoke of Jesus, the word which became flesh and dwelt among us, as John 1 tells us. Jesus didn't come and live his life in secret. He, he walked about, moved around. People knew of him and heard of all that he did. And these Gentiles here were of no exception. They knew the reports about Jesus. He wasn't hidden from them. He wasn't kept from them. This truth was there for them. And how did Jesus do all these great things? It says it's through the, the powering of the Holy Spirit. How God, in verse 38, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with them. And man, if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more do we, right? I pray that daily we are seeking the Lord, saying, Lord, fill me today with your Holy Spirit. Empower me today just to live for you and to carry out all that you have for me. I can't do it on my own. You can't do it on your own. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, how much more must we be dependent upon the Spirit's working in our lives? And he'll do that as we simply ask him. And in verse 39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Now, Jesus was not some, you know, made up folklore. Many people were witnesses of him. Peter was personally says that Jesus was crucified. He was hung on a tree, as was prophesied. But he rose again on the third day. Peter declares the gospel. And this was, this, was, this was paramount to the truth, the gospel that they preached in the early church. It was all about Jesus, that he died and he rose again. Because the resurrection of Jesus validates the very work that he did. It wasn't, and it wasn't just an empty tomb that, set, that was there as proof it's the very fact that he walked among them after his resurrection. And he was witnessed by many people. And it even says that Peter and others drank and ate with him, revealing that this resurrected body was not just some spirit or ghost. This was not some kind of just vision that they were seeing. This was a physical, material body that they were able to touch, that they ate and drank with. And he commanded us to preach to the people. And to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that. Through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Now here's the thing, guys. So we are all going to one day stand before God. All roads do lead to God. But here's the thing. We're either going to stand before the judge, who is Jesus, as it says here, and hear a good verdict, or stand before the judge for our sentencing. It's one of two options here. Everybody is going to stand before the Lord one day. And he's going to be that judge of both the living and the dead. The way to ensure a good verdict is to simply believe in his name now. Notice what Peter says there. It's through his name. Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. It's not by living a good life. It's not by doing good things as Cornelius here can attest to, right? A devout man giving generously, praying always. It's not through doing good things or living a good life. It's by belief in Jesus Christ and who he is and what he's done for us. It's by putting our trust in Jesus Christ that a person is saved. Man, we need to communicate that truth to people. The gospel is simple. But you know how many people are walking around thinking, oh, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, and yet their reason 
or their belief for why they're going to go to heaven is because they're a good person? Man, how we need to realize that we are wretched people, sinners, who are simply saved by the grace of God. We have nothing in ourselves. Don't even try to stand <laughs> upon your own merit or righteousness. Because our righteousness is seen as filthy rags before God. We have nothing but praise the Lord. We have his grace and that's enough to save us. It's by grace that we are saved through faith in who Jesus is. Praise the Lord for that. Now let's close out the chapter here. It says in verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. So as Peter was simply preaching Jesus to them, there came a time where these Gentiles just, you know, quietly received him as their Lord and Savior. They, they heard enough. Jesus is the one that died. He rose again. He's alive today. You witnessed him. You ate and drank. Man, that's the one that we need to put our trust in. And quietly they just, they put their belief, their trust, and received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that's when people are saved, right? When they simply acknowledge their need for him and they put their trust in him. When they yield to God and embrace Jesus as, your, as their Savior by faith in their heart. There's no altar call needed, but there will be an altered life that takes place here. And those with Peter were, were quite astonished at this scene. Remember, he's, it tells us that he brought brethren with him from Joppa. These were fellow Jews that came with him to, to witness his work, to maybe be with Peter, keep him accountable, or just to again see what was going on but they're quite astonished at this scene because the holy spirit was being poured out on these people in a very tangible way because when a person gets saved what happens the holy spirit fills that person right it's the you know the holy spirit comes in and seals them basically of this work it's the guarantee of what god is ultimately going to do you know for all of eternity so every believer that gives life to the lord the holy spirit is in them and this now is confirmed for them as these people now are beginning to respond in the Holy Spirit. It's showing that they're born again, that there's real truth and evidence to now them giving their life to the Lord. And notice the order. They heard the word, right? Then believed and then received the Holy Spirit. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And it's so important that we are those getting the word of God out. Peter simply preached Jesus and it led to them getting saved. And now they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice here, verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. And just as at Pentecost now, the people here spoke in tongues. Now, I believe this was a great evidence of them being filled with the Holy Spirit but it's, I believe it's not the evidence of a spirit-filled life or a, a life that's been baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is simply an expression of the Holy Spirit filling them. I believe that they were just so overcome that they just began to praise God. And that's what the filling of the Holy Spirit is going to do, right? The filling of the Holy Spirit is going to enable us to be those that are being a witness. That's the role of the Holy Spirit is to, to magnify Jesus, to make Jesus known. Look what John 15, 16 says. When the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. He's going to make Jesus known. And in John 16, 14, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit comes and he enables us to live a life as a witness, all right, to make Jesus known. And what are these people doing? They're speaking in tongues, but they're magnifying God. And the, the people there understood that, that they understood they were magnifying God. At the day of Pentecost, they were not speaking in unknown languages. They were speaking in languages unknown to the speaker, but known to the various crowds around them. And they heard them declaring the wonderful works of God. It was giving glory to God. I believe that's the evidence of a life that's filled with the Holy Spirit, that's baptized in the Holy Spirit, is that they're going to bring God glory. Because it's a removal of the self and flesh. It's an empowering the Holy Spirit to make God known. It's not so that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not so that we can, you know, roll around or 
speak wildly and do these crazy and have these crazy events or you know church parties going on that absolutely bring no glory to God. That's not the purpose. It's to make God known, to glorify God, so that we can be witnesses. In the book of Acts, people were filled with the Holy Spirit that they might go and be a greater witness for them, for, for, for the Lord. And these people here now are glorifying God. They're being a witness of him. And so afterwards, Peter commanded them to be baptized in water. This is not, you know, for salvation. It was because they were already saved. It simply recognized the salvation that they had already received and gave them that opportunity to proclaim this good news. And it was good news indeed, wasn't it? That what's going on in this chapter. Good news, guys, because the realization is that God has come to save all people. Gentiles are now being added into the church. They're not having to become Jews. They're just being brought into the family of God. They're being brought in to the church. And now they're functioning as one. Isn't that great? That salvation is going out to all people. Good people, bad people, Jews, Gentiles. You don't need to come through the law or any requirement. You just need to come and humble yourself before God and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And these people here now in Cornelius' house are attesting to that. They're being a witness of that. And here we're seeing a pivotal point in history as salvation now is going out to not just an individual who's outside of Israel, but to an entire group. And it's going to be the movement now in the book of Acts as the gospel is going to go out now to Gentile territories and all people are going to have the chance to be saved. What a great God we serve. He's not partial and willing to save all that will simply come to him and respond to all that he's done for them. So praise the Lord for that. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you here tonight and we thank you, Lord, for um, this time that we can again just come to you and look to you and hear from you, God. And Lord, you've spoken to us here through your word and I pray that, Lord, you've, you've put something in each of our hearts, God, that can be that which we just take home with us here today, a, a truth, a revelation, something that, Lord, is going to really um, just do a work in our lives and strengthening us encouraging us or challenging us, Lord. God, that we might be those that are living for you in a greater, more fuller way. God, help us to be those that are stepping out in faith, not limiting you in any way, but saying, Lord, what do you want to do in my life today? God, use me for all that you have. Lord, let me be that person that's stepping out in faith, just like Peter did, and is opening his heart for what you want to do. So God, just bless Everyone here tonight, Lord, bless this church. I pray that we would be a church that has a heart to get the gospel out, to go and move and, and uh, just be missional, Lord, to see people come to know you as their Lord and Savior. May we be instrumental in that. We know it's of you and it's by your spirit, but may we take those steps to say, Lord, use me. Let me share the gospel with people, Lord, that we'd see your family attitude. We pray for the work tomorrow night in Vancouver, God, that you bless the, the study there and that, Lord, as they go and share your word, that people would be brought in, you'd draw them by your spirit again, that they'd be hearing your word and uh, hearing the gospel, and we'd see people getting saved there. So bless that work tomorrow night and all that goes on this week, God. We ask this all in your awesome and precious name, Jesus. Amen.